All right, Rocky, well, let's start at the very beginning yes. here. I thought that maybe your nickname was given to you by your teammates, <laughs> but then I did some reading and I found out it actually started a long, long time ago. A long, long time ago, obviously. Well, yes, it did start a long time ago. I was born in Appleton, Wisconsin, and my father um, and my mother uh, opened up a neighborhood bar back in 1945. I came along in 1946, and being the first born of the family, uh, dad obviously, like all parents, was very proud of his son, and sure. the guys would come in from the mills at uh, back in Appleton, which were the paper mills and not steel mills, but they'd come in um, and they'd say, hey, Bob, how's that, uh, how's that new kid of yours? Oh, being very proud, he said, oh, you should see him. He's got all these little muscles. He's, he's like a little rock sitting in that crib. And they'd come back later and they'd say, hey, Bob, how's that little rock of yours? <laughs> He'd go, what do you mean? You know, your kid. <laughs> and that's how I got it. So the name kind of just I've stuck. <laughs> had it ever since. That's right. So then you get to high school and you're a three-sport athlete. You did track, basketball, and football. And obviously, long-term football ended up working out the best. Um, how did the skills from basketball and track help you through football, do you think? Well, you know, I, I, you know, so that was a period of time. And, you know, and it just... But I'm old. So that was a period of time growing up back in the 50s and in the, back in the 50s specifically is that uh, organized sports weren't as um, a, 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 as great as it is uh, in today's society. So you played in the backyard, you had pickup games, you played rec teams, and so, but you just played, you know, so you played basketball, you played football, you played baseball, neighborhood guys, you get together and you'd start to play. Um, and what I've what I've learned is that um, is that each sport, you know, has its own set of disciplines that help you as growing as an athlete, from eye-hand coordination, playing basketball to uh, you know to to football, just from a balance perspective, uh, baseball, eye-hand again, you know, sure. being able to catch and hit the ball and and so on. So, so all those things, all those things, and I have to say, in all honesty, help. Uh, as you move forward and you, um, and, 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 and you get better at one sport, but you also find out what you like, what you don't like, what you're good at, what you're not good at, things that you work, uh, uh, work on. And so obviously um, football was, you know, it was one that was going to fit my, uh, uh, my stature. Um, basketball, we played basketball, obviously, but <laughs> when you're 5'9", <laughs> You're not going to play sure. <laughs> uh, in college and or, or in the pros. Right, so. but it was football that kind of, uh, you know, paved the way, yeah. you could say, for you to then get accepted into Notre Dame. Um, yeah. And like you said, in that time, not everybody went to college, right? No. Uh, it had to have been an exciting day to get that acceptance letter. Well, it was. It, it, I mean, it was. And so it was like, <laughs> it was like, how do you decide? You know, so we had a very good, and I just want to say, we had a great high school um, um, football team. And because of the success, and I, and I tell people this, because of the success of the team, we, we had um, never lost a game. I never lost a, 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 a football game in high school. And we were the number one ranked team in the state of Wisconsin. And you, you, for that, you get all conference honors and you get all state honors and so on. But it was the team, you know? I mean, if you played sure. on a losing team, I don't know if you, <laughs> you'd get those, that, the, 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 that respect and, or, and those honors. But, because of that, you get noticed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was several schools that had uh, uh, offered uh, uh, scholarships. University of Wisconsin, since I was there, is one I went to Notre Dame. I obviously was another one. Um, and, uh, and Boston College came out of the nowhere. And so I took a trip to each and every one of those to kind of, you know, see how you as, fit. But as, you know, an 18-year-old, it has to be, feel pretty good to be wanted, right? Oh, you have, no, you have these, right. these people all over the place I mean, wanting you to play for them. <laughs> that's right. It's a, it's a nice, it, it really was, it, it, you know, yes, you get a, a, a little ego boost. You sure. Know, because somebody wants you to be able to come and, and play on their, uh, on their team. And so. Um, how did you land on Notre Dame? Well. You know, we went. You so we, we, I went to those three schools specifically, and then uh, being born and raised Roman Catholic, sixteen, well, twelve years of Catholic education, which turned into sixteen. But anyway, you, 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 
you do what all good Catholic boys are taught to do at that time, and that is to go to church and mm -hmm. pray for guidance and direction, and you make the right choice, mm -hmm. and, and which I did. And, they, and then I did what my mother wanted me to do, and that was to go to Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's how I got to Notre Dame. <laughs> uh, I mean, you obviously had a great time at Notre Dame, lots of success at Notre Dame. What yeah. was one of your favorite memories of the You time? know, it just, it, I, you know, it's like I look at the time, and, in, and Notre Dame had changed, and Era Parsegian, uh, the legendary coach now, had just came in, it was his first year. We were his first recruited class. And um, by my junior year, you know, we're, we're, we're undefeated and we're playing well and they don't have bowl games like they do now. They don't have a playoff system and it was a mythical a national championship, but we were in contention uh, of, of, of possibly winning that. And, and probably the biggest game that we played was that year against Michigan State, who was also undefeated. Uh, and it was f the first time that two undefeated teams got a chance to meet at the end of the season. So we'll have a definitive answer of right. that mythical national championship. Oh, who's and it was better? A, and who's better? And, we, right. and finally, <laughs> and it's not just a vote, it's who's better. Right. And the game ended in a tie. Now you have to understand if you're on a tie. Yeah, there was, you know, there was no overtime. There was no sudden death. Right. It just, it, 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 as as I as I say in the play at time, it was common sense. I mean, football's right. football. It was common sense, uh, and uh, and that was the end of the game. It was a tie, and so we had one game left. Michigan State did not. We had one game left, in which we had to go out and play Southern California, out there in California. And we beat them 51 to nothing on a Saturday. Wow. And so on Monday, we were the number one team. <laughs> so obviously that championship, a huge deal in your life. And it led then to the NFL. Now, yeah. we talk to young athletes all the time that you say, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say an NFL athlete. Right. But nobody really, I think, I think it's kind of hidden how that process works. How does that even happen? Oh, Do you get a phone call? What happens? That's right. So that process for me specifically, and again, you know, and I just have to put it back in time, unlike today where we have television, everybody knows who's, who's, who's available in the draft. We get more information than we really need to know, and right. it's on television 24 hours as the draft comes up and so on and so on. I think last year there was like 23 million people that watched the NFL draft. In 1968, I think there was three people that watched it. <laughs> it, wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even on so, right. or listened to it anyway. Right. Um, so it took place over a weekend, the draft does. Friday uh, is the first uh, round of the draft and they go through three or four rounds. Now, you have to understand, there were 17 rounds back then. And so <laughs> Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. So uh, a, a, a couple of my teammates, and I, we had gone out to dinner. We, we were invited to go out to dinner. We had a shirt and tie on, and so we went out to dinner, and afterwards, we'd stopped over at some friend's house, and we're sitting like this, and right. we're just talking, man, eh, what's, you know, uh, what's happening at school, where we're gonna go, you know, what's gonna go, it's just gonna, when the 11 o'clock news came on, and the sports came on, and so we're just here, and it said, oh, and today in the draft, uh, several uh, local players uh, were, were, were taken in the NFL draft, you know, from Purdue, out of South Bend, so-and-so, this out of Indiana, so-and-so. And, -so. and um, uh, uh, Notre Dame's uh, captain, Bob Rocky Blyer, was drafted number 16th by the Pittsburgh Steelers. So they didn't even call you? No, 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 no. So there's a lull <laughs> in our conversation. And uh, my friends go, hey, congratulations. Anyway, so uh, what do you think about that professor? <laughs> that was the extent. That was the extent of it. So yeah, nobody called on it, it wasn't a it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a big deal. So that was it. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, just one year into the NFL, and had to have been an exciting year just to be there. Yeah. Um, and then you get drafted to the Vietnam War. Um, what, I mean, what was the feeling like at that moment? You, were, you had worked kind of your whole life at that point <laughs> well, to play right. football, yeah. and, but now you have uh, both an opportunity and an obligation to serve your country. Yeah, so a lot was going on back in the 60s during mm -hmm. that period of time. 
when through college, as well as, you know, my first year here in 1968 or the fall of 1968. Um, but uh, there was a, a lot of student protests that were taking place about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of social unrest about um, uh, the rights of uh, African Americans, mm -hmm. and that was taking place, and so all this turmoil was 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 happening. And so I come to Pittsburgh, excited to play as a professional, although it was with Pittsburgh, you know, and um, who only won two games that season, just to put it in perspective. <laughs> for, for we don't have to bring that part up <laughs> for everybody at that time. But you were kind of part of the NFL, you right, know, you yeah. just not as much hype as they have today. So obviously a lot of friends from college and or high school had been drafted um, into the uh, armed services or joined mm -hmm. the armed services not to be drafted. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we watched Vietnam on, on television as it unfolded and things that were taking place. So it was always in the back of your mind, you know, and. Um, probably the happiest day of my life, and I have to tell you this just on the side, at that moment in time was we were in training camp. It was toward the end of training camp, and Bill Austin was our head coach. Um, and after a meeting, um, he had pulled me aside, and he said, listen, um, I wanted to let you know that uh, this, uh, this came in the mail and it was open accidentally which was my 1A classification for my student deferment at that mm. time. And so now I was eligible for the draft. He said, we think you're, uh, we think you're good enough to make this team and, and we'll take care of this for you. Mm. Whatever taking care of this meant, which in my mind was, well, I'll probably get into a reserve unit or National Guard unit to help take care of that obligation, and which was all uh, at that time people were, 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 were filling in. Um, and so time went on and time went on and time went on and, you know, nothing came through. And it was 1968. Just to put in perspective for your listeners out there, 19, it was the height of the war. We sure. had 500,000 men in, 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 in women over in Vietnam at Did that time. Did you think because of your success in football that this wasn't going to happen to you? Yeah, I didn't. I, I thought I would fall into, you know, that uh, reserve component, mm -hmm. you know, and or National Guard component where you go through basic training and then come back and be assigned, you know, sure. on a weekend and still play football. You kind of get the best of both worlds, right? Yeah, that was the best of both worlds. That's, yeah. that's what had taken place. Well, time would go on and on and on. And so then I, <laughs> so then I, I went in and this was like in the October or November. And he, did you hear anything? <laughs> right. You know about this? And they, well, you know, we're having a little problem. The general uh, retired, and the congressman got defeated, and they, so all their contacts were it seemed like. Uh, and I go, oh, okay, fine. He said, but don't worry. Here's the kiss of God. Don't worry. We talked to your draft board back in Wisconsin, and they're not drafting till the end of the year, so we have some time to be able to. I think it was the next day. <laughs> it was it was shortly thereafter where I got. Uh, my notification. Well, you mentioned it's the height of the war. Yeah. Um, every, you know, like you said, there were, there were protesters. Um, you knew what it, you would have been watching the Vietnam War on, on television. It's not like you didn't know what it looked like. Yeah. So you, you find out you're drafted. Um, it has to be scary. Yeah, you know, it was I, I, not so much scary, but as an unknown, you know, and mm -hmm. so it was an unknown. And the only reference that I had about war specifically was what we saw on television and then those memories of whatever whatever army pictures <laughs> I, or movies that i saw yeah. um with john wayne and so in that in a little that, unrealistic <laughs> right yeah. that's right and that aspect it, it was combined and um but it was, but i also think this and at least for me was that you know part of my training part of my training was always going to training camp <laughs> So right. in high school and in college, you'd go to camp, you know, right, beforehand, right. two, three weeks, you know. You, uh, you, they use that same term in the Army. <laughs> that's right. Not quite the same, same thing, thing, but the same but term. It's the same term. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, so you just kind of put yourself in that mental uh, frame of mind and just, you know, turn it off and just go through what needs to go through. You know, you go through basic training, you go through advanced, and you get your orders and, yeah, I got my orders like, you, you know, the majority of guys, and we're going to be a replacement over to Vietnam. So while you're there, um, you have 
a scenario happen that leads you to later win the bronze star and the purple heart. Um, why, do, why don't you tell us what it was that happened and um, then what it was like to be recognized for, for that later in life? Because at the moment, obviously, that's the last thing you're thinking about is, is recognition, but yeah. it, it, led, it led to you becoming uh, an American hero, a well, war hero. <laughs> you know, and, and I, think, I think one of the things, that just to put it in the context, is that all of us who had served in Vietnam during that period of time, you know, and it wasn't so much that everybody, you know, was gun ho for that war because that was not the, it, it was not the case. It was not a, uh, it was not the same feeling like World War II and everybody, it, I mean, all citizens were supporting that mm -hmm. war. You know, it was such a, 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 a devastating war for why we were there and protests that were taking place. Uh, but it was part, it was like, okay, I got drafted, I'm over here, okay? Mm -hmm. And why I'm here, the, I, I'll, I do my duty, you know, whatever that duty is to be a, able to, you know, get through and, you know, you're gonna spend two years in the military and that was that, the, the responsibility at that, at that time. And so you do and you put your time in. And so uh, you, you know, and I reflect back and, and all veterans that I they see today that had fought that war, um, whether they wanted to be there or not, ultimately feel grateful and proud that they served their country in, 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 in some cases. So in, anyway, so it, 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 as far as, um, um, all right, we have to take a break. Yeah. I forgot the question. <laughs> It's okay. It was, uh, just tell us what, what it was that, that led to the injuries that, that, that you uh, Oh, okay, fine, thank you. And then later, obviously, then later the recognition. Yeah, yeah. Right, right, It's okay. Right, right. <laughs> I have those moments too, you get talking <laughs> and <laughs> before you know it. Anyway, so, um, so the situation that arose, and I didn't find this information out until much later, was that there was a strong movement from a North Vietnamese uh, regiment that was working its way down into um, Hep Duc, which was the area in which I, our unit was operating. Mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted to uh, liberate this, this, this township called Hep Duc. Uh, and so they had moved down um, it, the Marine Corps were, were kind of pushing them towards us. We were kind of a retaining force, as mm -hmm. I found out later. So basically what had taken place was another company. I was in Charlie Company, Bravo Company, was out in the field. Quickly how we operate in, in, in an area of operation was that we worked off of two mountains or landing zones mm -hmm. where the artillery would be placed and a company each would be on one of these uh, hills as two companies would be then in the field and we'd rotate on a seven to 10 day basis. Um, anyway, we're up on um, Siberia, which was one of the LZs and Bravo Company had been hit and they were in a firefight and uh, word came that we were gonna go support them, get them out. So helicopters came in, took us down into the valley uh, and by the time we got to them that evening, um, the, 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 their, their, their firefight had, uh, had calmed down. And so um, we went in to get them out of that hot spot. In so doing, we pulled front and rear security, got them out late at night, moving back to a secured area. And we ran into a machine gun nest um, in a quick firefight that we had, the word was to leave the bodies that we were carrying out and we'll come back and pick them up a couple days later. So that was our mission. I'd come back and retrieve those bodies, so we could the helicopters come in and, and, and extract them. Uh, and that was part of the group that I was with. And so we had just taken a break uh, about eight o'clock in the morning, trying to find our location. We found it. We have to walk out onto an open rice paddy. Uh, as we're crossing this open rice paddy, the word was obviously keep five yards distance between one another, keep your eyes, ears open, the enemy, they're around. Um, and our point man saw a movement across the berm. And as an excitement, would holler gook gook, shots broke the stillness, as I recall. And then all of a sudden, 
they started to run and he started to chase and pulling everybody out in the middle of that rice paddy. When a machine gun started to level that area, boy, bodies were diving left and right into the rice paddy, trying to find out where that machine gun nest was, what was taking place. My responsibility, I was an, uh, I carried the M79 grenade launcher. Basically it was like a one shot shotgun deal. Right. Where you break it, put a grenade in, and then shoot it off your hip. I saw the machine gun where it was, my responsibility to get some firepower over there. So I breached my grenade as I was in the race paddy trying to get a shot off when I got hit the first time. Discharged my round, I thought, oh, we better get out of that and get some protection. Um, and we got enough firepower I did on that position. Four guys were pinned down in front of me and they got out of there. And then um, the medic and I crawled back to our commanding officer were out of that little wooded area mm -hmm. where we had set up. The rest of the platoon kindly came back in, finally after about 20 minutes or so, when we set up a defensive position. We didn't know what we ran into. Uh, they probed our perimeter and got close enough to throw a, a hand grenade in through the air. And I can remember seeing it twirling uh, end over end uh, and hit my commanding officer. Uh, who was lying prone, looking out over the rice paddy, right in the middle of the back. Now, it didn't go off, but it bounced off of him and rolled towards where I was, and I jumped to get out of the way, and it blew up. At that time, blew up through my right foot, knee, and thigh. Uh, and again, we're in another firefight until yeah. the platoon fought its way down and dragged us out of there, and we finally got to a secured area. But that's what took place at that, uh, at that moment. Incredible. I mean, that's, uh, so, uh, sorry, that's, it's just, it's hard, I mean, it, you, you're, you describe it um, so vividly, and to, to picture that moment, yeah. um, the next thing doesn't even sound uh, dramatic or, or anything at all, but you, you get back, luckily, you're alive, right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have to yeah. count that blessing, and you're in the hospital bed, and they tell you, you're never going to play football again. Well, and to I, say, I mean, to, to say you played football again is an understatement. <laughs> you, you came back with a bang. Right. You know, so, yeah, so that question, the question that we all have at times, especially when the injuries or, mm -hmm. or when you're sick or whenever you're overcoming, you know, something, you want to know, okay, can I do what I wanted to do? What I wanted to do was to get back and play. That had been my, my focal point all during that period of time when I was in the service, that someday, I'll, you know, I'll be able to get back, blah, blah. So anyway, I'm in the, in, the, in, in the hospital and, you know, those thoughts are going through your mind. Uh, and um, so I finally get enough courage to ask my doctor, what did he think? Given my wounds, do you think I can come back and play this game? Now, you know, so being the, being the logical, rational doctor that he was and looking at me, you know, and not to get your hopes up too high and just say, hey, you know, you'll have a normal life. Don't worry about it. You'll be able to walk and do those things, but don't ex just don't expect kind to of get back. Count your blessings. Yeah, yeah sort count of your blessings. Don't expect to get back in the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you just you, you probably won't have the strength or or the flexibility um, to come back and play this game. But it was an interesting thing because it was like, you know, he was the authority, and all of a sudden, he didn't give me any sense of hope, and he just sucked that little hope right out. Okay. Uh, and you go, oh, okay, now. Part of this story as well, out of the blue, two days later, I get a postcard in the mail. Simple postcard. It's got two lines on it. It said, Rock, team's not doing well. We need you. Art Rooney. Well, there's your hope. There's my hope. It's a, not that they needed me, but somebody took the time just to mm -hmm. care, you know? And obviously, as the story unfolds, being the fam, that they, were at that time and still are. I mean, they gave me an opportunity. They allowed me to come back. And in, 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 I maybe came back too soon. I had shrapnel still on my foot. Um, they uh, put me on injured reserve that year. I came back and, um, and had another operation. I came back the following year and I made the taxi squad or now what they call the developmental squad. But they bought me two years. I mean, two years of an opportunity, two years to heal, two years to get strong. Well, then you got to do something with that. And, you know, so I came back and made the team. Um, and, and this was in 1972. So I was um, leading ground gainer. 
during the exhibition season. <laughs> now, what people have to understand, we had six exhibition games. <laughs> and, and, and ultimately, ultimately, is that the reason that, and I, and I just tell that off on, on the side, the reason that I was the leading ground gainer wasn't because I was bigger, better, faster. I just played more than anybody else. They were trying to make a decision. I carried the ball more than else. They are trying to cut me. And so given those two simple statistics, I better be the leading ground gainer. So 1972 comes, I make the team playing special teams. I never carried the ball. Why? Because we have the sensational rookie by the name of Franco Harris who comes <laughs> in from Penn State and uh, sets a rushing record for the Steelers in that year. And we get to the playoffs for the first time in 40 years. Um, that they've been in existence, and we have one magical play that changes the course and direction called the Immaculate Reception, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and we use that and we move, we move on, but just to be able to be a part of it. And probably the whole story here is just, you know, uh, having somebody that would give you an opportunity, doing something with that opportunity. I can only do what I can do. I can't make that final decision that I want to make this team. That has to be by a third yeah, party, sure. you know. But how do you take that opportunity and then change it into four Super Bowl wins? And not, <laughs> oh, not only four Super Bowl wins, but the first four Super Bowl wins for Pittsburgh yes. Steelers ever. Ever, you know. And I so mean, ever. That's a pretty big deal, right? That is, that is a, that is a <laughs> big deal. Do you ever deal. pinch yourself and still think, how did oh, we do that? Yeah, you know, and it just, I, and you do. As time goes by and you look at all the teams that have passed since then, um, and you go, wow. I mean, to win four Super Bowls in six years with that crew and core of people, there's 22 people that played on those teams or have four Super Bowl rings from one team. You know, today that probably would not have happened and will not happen again in that, in that condensed period of time. But just to be able to be a part of that, and ultimately, you know, as I, as the story unfails, is that the, you know, the reason that I get a chance to play isn't because of my size and speed, you no, know, two things I do not possess, but ultimately because of one talent. Um, and, um, and that was, uh, <laughs> and that was in 1974 when I got a chance to start after a couple injuries to other players, I got a chance to play, um, and, uh, in a, in a, was, in a, in a, it was a game that I, that I got a chance to start. And the reason I got a chance to start very simply, um, was that, uh, Chuck Noll had told our running back, he said, you have a weakness in your backfield said, who is your best blocker? And he said, well, Blyer. He said, well, then start him. So, and I tell people, he said, one talent, really, in all honesty, yeah. one talent. Um, and then, and I got a chance to start and we win the game and it's like winning. So we win the game Well, we get to play next week, you know, and we win that game. And so things start to work and we win the division and we go to the playoffs and we win the playoffs and we go to the Super Bowl and you win the Super Bowl, and then you do it again, and, we and do again, it again, and again, and again, and we play six <laughs> more years together in that backfield just to be a part of that. Um, you know, and I think the other thing too is that how you fit yourself into a team, because it's really the success of the team that uh, that uh, gives you the recognition for your contribution to that success. You know, so we got uh, we got those nine Hall of Famers. You know, right. just to you know, just to be able to say I. I carried their water, <laughs> <You know? laughs> or, or, or I made sure that they were comfortable. Or, well, you know, part of that, but that. anyway. Uh, yeah. So all these years later, you're known as a football star, yeah. an American war hero. How do you find the theater? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, it's you kind know, of a it, funny combination. It, you know, it really is, and it, it, to some degree. Um, now, part of my career, or part of what I did afterwards, was. Um, you know, I would do, <laughs> I'd do, I, I would, I would be a speaker. I became, would become a speaker. Okay. Right. So not because I wanted to become a speaker. That was not my goal at all. It was one of those opportunities that, you know, that persist, uh, persist. Um, and we're winning. Okay. So, and I'll tell you, this is a very quick story. It was like this. Sister Mary Louise from St. Teresa Catholic Day School. <laughs> Called Mr. There's Louis. always a good story when it starts with Sarah, <laughs> Sister Mary Louise. I have to say, of all the stories I've heard, there's probably six or seven of them that have started with that exact sentence. That's right. <laughs> called Mr. Rooney and said, um, listen, we have our sports banquet. Do you think 
that uh, Mr. Bradshaw would come and speak. And Mr. Rooney would say, well, sister, I, I know that he does that. I will ask him, but you know, I also think that he charges like $500 to do so. Pregnant pause, and she goes, oh. Well, do you think maybe that nice Mr. Joe Green might come and speak? <laughs> and he said, oh, well, I know he does that. I can ask him as well, but I think he also charges like $500, another pregnant pause. Oh. Do you have anybody for nothing? <laughs> he said, yeah, we can send you Blyer. <laughs> so so it, it was one of those things. That, you know, so you go, oh, okay, fine. We well, go, all right, free mill's a free mill when you're, you know, right. the 16th round draft. So I said, okay, fine. And so, so I wrote, so I wrote, so I wrote a speech. I get there, unfold my speech, and read it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here. A lot of things have happened to me over the last couple of years, some of them good and some of them bad. Then like after about three or four years, I could go, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of things have happened to me over the last couple of years, some of them good and some of them bad. Then after another three or four years, I could put them like on three by five cards. <laughs> but, <laughs> one but step I, at a time. <laughs> that's right. Once, but, I, but, I, I, but what became important was that we were winning. And because we were winning and because we were champions, we as players became in demand. And because I had a story, as we're talking about now, um, I got a chance to do a lot. So I think through that whole period of time, I probably did every grade school and junior high in western Pennsylvania and the panhandle of West Virginia and upstate New York <laughs> through that period of time. But it was a training ground and it was, a, you know, it was, it was something that you learn and I enjoyed doing it and got immediate feedback and, you know, you wanted to become better. So in, 19, in 2014, there was a book that was being written about the Steelers. Gary Pomerantz was writing the book and it was like, a copy of the Boys of Summer when they talked about the Brooklyn Dodgers back in the in the 50s and he thought that the Steelers of the 70s was uh, kind of that counterpart and so uh, we did interviews and so on and he and he let me read the first manuscript so I'm reading the first man I'm, I'm going man all these stories I didn't know about. I mean, stories I didn't know about. And I thought, yeah. well, wouldn't it be kind of cool? You know, so you get a thought. The thought sure. is, wouldn't it be kind of cool to tell those stories? I mean, amongst the stories that you already tell and have, you know, and, 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 and have this tale. Well, like anything else, you need, you need, <laughs> you need somebody to give you some um, um, support. So yeah, I'd ask a friend, mm -hmm. what do you think about this? Oh, I think that's perfect, you know? That's sure. all the fuel that you need. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you ask somebody else, and you ask somebody else, and you ask somebody else. And I was thinking, oh, maybe we could do a one-man show or something like this, and they, because we had the stage experience, you know, put this together, and oh, yes, yeah, so I'll help you, and we'll do this. So ultimately, it boiled down to um, getting a writer. <laughs> I, had a, I had a committee that didn't work, I had to write. And so Gene Collier, and I talked to Gene Collier because he had written The Chief about Mr. Rooney and his life. Yeah. And so Gene uh, took on that project. Um, and he said, I, no, he said, I'll tell you this, all those stories that you want to do, he said, they've already been told. They're in books, you know, people. What hasn't been told is your story. And mm -hmm. I think there's more to that story to be told um, that, uh, that needs to be told. I said, yeah, you think so? He said, oh yeah, that's all. And so we started, and he started to, to write it. And so he did a marvelous job. And in the, in the, in the, inside this whole production you know, of, of the theater, and again, it goes back to whether I was in the military or, 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 or playing sports, it's all about the success of the team and who supports you within mm -hmm. that uh, with, w within that method. So you get a great uh, set designer, you get a gr good a, a, a great director, and then all the lighting and the sound and the stage management and all those people that came together uh, to put that whole show together because you're just one you're just one piece. I mean, right. you're the front piece, but you know it doesn't happen unless all the other pieces So if you had in. to describe the play for somebody who wanted to come see it or maybe might not know about it and is looking for something to do, how would, right. in, in an elevator speech, how would you describe <laughs> the play? I think, 
basically the play is a story, okay? Uh, and it's not about football, and it's not about the Steelers, um, but it's more about life and our own stories, because we all have a story uh, of, of how it, 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 of how it, um, it comes together. Um, and so it, it's, it's, it's a story of laughter and, and, and characters, uh, and it's also a story of tears of, uh, uh, and emotions that, uh, that, that we all feel at one time or another. Um, and so it's kind of put into a capsule this period of my life told about my life, but really it's one that people identify with because it's all about their lives as well. Right. Well, I think that's that. Okay. Hey, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Yeah.